you write your CV, you've got the job spec there, you yeah. know you've done everything, and you actually tailor your CV perfectly yeah. to that job spec. Mm -hmm. They turn around and say, we found a better person, a better fit for that project. And you're thinking, no, you haven't. You know, <laughs> I've done exactly the same project for about three, four times. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and yeah. I've put down everything in that job spec. Mm -hmm. So we found a better fit. And you think, no, you haven't. I've also come across quite a lot that they put down all these things in their job spec. And you think, well, I've done all that. You know, and then they take somebody else because... Firstly, you're asking, you know, say, say for instance, 450 a day. For a yeah. Then they take somebody that's charging 300 for doing the same job. They're going to take the $300 uh, mm -hmm. for the pound one. And welcome to Career Spotlight with Vanessa Ajamai. Today I have another great guest. Make sure that you subscribe to this channel in order to hear amazing career journey stories about choices and decisions that people have taken in order to get to where they're currently at or where they're going. So today the guest that I have with me is Paul Truscott and he is an IT and telecoms project manager. Paul, thank you so much for agreeing to come and share your story today. Um, how are you well, doing? Okay. I'm not too bad, thank you. Great. So as usual, we'll jump straight into it. And normally just to give the viewers um, and listeners in more context, could you tell us like a bit about your most recent role and what that looks like. Um, I won't give you my most recent role because that turned out to be a non-starter. Okay. It's quite often it works yeah. out where, where they've changed the course of direction. Okay. They bring people in and then they suddenly take people away. So yeah. that was a short-lived one. But my <laughs> cool. most recent role was with Entity Data. I was okay. a permanent uh, employee. Um, there I had a very um, eventful um, couple of years um, with a completely varied roles from one day to another. I was brought in originally to do a HMRC um, program. Um, however, NCT never won the bid. It was uh, another competitor who won it. So they moved me on to doing other things. And as I say, it was very varied. Well, which suits me down to the ground because I don't really like getting stuck into the one type of role permanently. And um, so I was doing things like um, data modeling, um, planning out the cadence schedule for the next five years for um, one of their clients uh, and the development life cycle. I also um, design the development life, life cycle roadmap. Um, I also we built a data center for them just before COVID kit, well, during COVID actually, I got moved off of what I was working on and then got asked if I can put out this thing that had been going for a couple of years and they needed it repairing. So I came in and repaired it and we got deployed and everything successfully for a government client. That was the main driver behind it, it was the government client. However, we did have a load of other clients on the network as well, which we managed to bring across to the new the new system so that was a successful implementation um yeah and then COVID came along although NTT was very good about it um after six months they couldn't sustain it anymore and got um they had to release a whole group of people so that was that that was the last role as I say very very interesting very mm -hmm. um varying role yeah one project like this, I I went for I had about five different customers at the time, and mm -hmm. five, and each one of them was a completely different role. Yeah. Nice. Generally speaking, when you're looking like the overall project management role, what are like some of the key areas, um, functions within a PM? 
Um, I like to make sure that each project that I'm on is very well scheduled. You yeah. have um, very well controlled organization. Right? Yeah. You've got to keep on board your stakeholders, your business sure. owners, your, your product owner. Um, you like to inform them. I like to inform them personally on a daily basis. Um, obviously, depending on what type of methodology, methodology you're using at the time, um, we'll, we'll plan out your day. But I still like, even um, I like to um, have every day, I, I meet up with the team, see how they are, how they get along, um, how, if there's any hiccups, get straight onto it. If somebody's missing, make sure if, if someone doesn't turn up for work that day, they could be ill, something like that, make sure you can get someone in to cover their um, role that day. Um, if not, I have to reschedule. If, if it's a priority job that we're on, we have to re go to reschedule. Hopefully, it doesn't have too much of an impact, knock on impact that further down the line. So it's just basically keeping on top of those like, things. You, you're keeping the client happy, keeping your own um, team happy, um, your, home, your own stakeholders as well as the customer stakeholders ready, all happy. And I, I like to inform them all the time. And if, if something's bad's coming up, I like to tell them that something bad is going to happen instead of keeping it to yourself and then let it go off for a couple of weeks, especially when you have to have input from um, senior, senior management, which sometimes can be a bit of a um, difficult getting. You know, so once again, when you start out the project or even when if they've never had it done, I like to make a, a racing matrix so everybody knows their roles and responsibilities. That um, special documentation sign off, uh, which is sometimes I've been on projects where it's actually held it back for six months because people haven't signed off and stuff. So you have to make a careful decision whether you work to risk or you just stop and wait for it to get signed off. You know, so that's one of the things you have to really take on board. Yeah. So. What kind of approach do you normally take when you want to communicate if you mention something bad's going to happen? Um, it can be a number of ways. As I was saying, first thing in the morning, I, I normally like to go and have a, you know, in the corridor, have a chat with the um, the product owner, you know, or the sponsor. Yeah. And, you know, tell, tell them what's going on. So th there's no surprises when you go into a formal meeting. You know, mm -hmm. um, obviously, you can't always do that they're busy or you don't they're on holiday or something like that so you know um the other way you, you just do it when you've got obviously you have the regular meetings come up um i like to when the regular meetings come up i like to send out all the stuff the information to the people before the meeting takes place so they're prepped for the meeting you, you don't like to give the surprise there and put them on the spot yeah. you know so i like to give them the heads up before some stuff stuff as you just mentioned it can be sudden so mm -hmm. it has to be brought up either you'll notify them that something urgent's come up can we put a delay to the meeting if it's a regular meeting um can we postpone it and change it for a different day or maybe later that day um if their input is needed we can still go ahead but you've given them a heads up of what everything is about so once again it's not putting the senior management on the spot which is one thing i never ever want to do you know, yeah, of stuff, of course. You know yeah. because you've got to keep them on board. Yeah. What methodology have you used then in the environments that you've worked in? Um used all. Yeah. Um Prince, um, PM Bok, PMI, Agile, mm. Waterfall, uh, Safe. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And lot, as I said, I I go usually onto a client site and you have to adapt to their um, methodologies. A lot of it's um, even in-house written, but it's based, okay. usually, usually is based on something already. So you're not mm -hmm. going blind totally. Um, it's just they have different way of using it. So mm -hmm. they write it for themselves. I've actually written a me methodology for a client myself. So it would speed up the process. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've done that. So that's that's usually generally one of the first things you always find out what methodology you're using, how they're using it, is it well, is it robust? And 
you know, a lot of the time you find out you're actually coming in to police it because people go yeah. off and do their own thing. So you've actually got to be there to, to enforce the methodologies. Yeah. So if we take it right to like um back, how what how did you get into project management? By accident. <laughs> yeah. Um yeah, I I was I was in the forces for about 14 years and when I when I left the forces I was at um I was um in Germany. I, I settled in Germany and um I got a I got a role at Dusseldorf Airport and I, after a year I was thinking this isn't really for me day in and day out. Mm -hmm. So I went and looked for something different and I got into I found this course in university for um heterogeneous networking which sounds really interesting and it was incredibly interesting yeah. um, one, of the, one of the elements in that it was a it was a three-year the element of that six months was um, a diploma in um, project management where you learned different um, project management um, some of the software like um, Microsoft project for instance um, short track things like that um, brushed on a few things like um, other other bits of software that they were using at the time, which I don't think they're, they're around now. But okay. um, yeah, so and I, I really got into it because one of the things I do I do like is having an umbrella view of things that are going on on in the um workplace. You know, might 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 just say that I'm a nosy, but you know, I, I look especially when it comes down to dependencies. That's one of the big things I really like. You know, I don't like it; it's just the one thing I do like to keep on top of. Yeah, so, yeah, so okay. Now, when I finished that um, three years, the first job I got was funny enough it was a technical project manager for a small company in Germany, and it it, it just really um, brought out the best things that I I was really looking for. Something which was changeable daily. You know, I was going off down to client sites, visiting on site, you know, getting to see all their processes making sure all our um, processes were in place and they were happy with them. Um, yeah, so that was really good. And then I came back to the UK and just um, continued the project management side of things. Yeah, sure. And how did you find the transition from working in Germany and then coming into the UK as and working as a project manager? Um, bloody difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in Germany for quite some time you know, mm. as a civilian, um, seven years. Yeah, and I the first thing that I that really did impact was the first interview I went to and I couldn't understand a word that they were saying because I realized that I really only spoke German now. You know? <laughs> I, found, I found it very, very difficult. So I was trying trying to translate what they were saying into German. Yeah. Uh, that was that was a bit strange. But that only lasted about a year. You know, that, that was the biggest impact I immediately had. Um, the other thing I noticed in the UK was it was it was more of a um, contractor basis in project management. It very very project um, contracting. Um, so that was completely new. In Germany, we never had any of that. You know, it was always permanent roles. Um, yeah. Come to the UK, everything everything was contracting. And, and the first time I went down to an agency and I was talking about all this money, I think, what the hell? You know, all this big mm -hmm. money. And, of course, you see dollar signs chinging in your eyes. You know, um, sounds good, but it's not as good as what it sounded like. You know, yeah. there, there's a big, big change in the way you brought up and things like that. So, of course, First couple of roles I was doing, I I saw price. I was going for much much lower price because I was thinking, oh, I'm not worth that. I'm not worth that. You know. Then um, as as the time grew up, your, your wages were going up, and you're getting more bigger roles, more responsibility. Um, so some really big stuff, especially with the Y2K coming up, and I was on that, and you, you could print your own money. I don't know why, but it was a bit silly. I, I used to work for Nortel Networks. You know, I was actually there when they they crashed and went um, bankrupt. You know, so that was also a bit of a 
um, stressy time. And it wasn't too long. I was actually working in Portugal at that time. Uh, it wasn't too long after that that I then moved to Australia. Once again, Australia was very um, permanent um, centric. Yeah. And, you know, so it was a transition again. But when I was in Australia, I, I continuously had role after role. When one role would finish, I'd move on to the next role. You know. So that, that worked actually very well because it was more word of mouth. Obviously, smaller population and yeah. it didn't matter where you went you knew somebody <laughs> you know and unlike here where the much bigger population and you know you just don't know anybody when you go into a new firm uh, over there it was guaranteed you'd know at least two or three people that you've worked yeah. on another place you know which was also good to catch up with. I, I had a great time in australia but um for personal reasons we came back in the uk and uh, once again, I'm finding the transition very, very difficult. Um, because, first of all, I couldn't get any roles because they were saying, um, you haven't got enough UK experience. Mm. And I thought, well, actually, you know, I've had quite a bit. I was born yeah. here and things like that. And, you know, that didn't matter. I didn't think it mattered. And then, then I got, got a role. And then they're saying, uh, there was always excuse after excuse. And then came the age barrier. You know, mm. still kinders, although they're not allowed to say it's age related, um, 100% it is. You know, because I, I was talking to agents and they say, Oh, no, they're definitely crying out for you. I'll have you in for an interview straight away. Yeah. You know, um, they don't. You know, the interview never comes along, you know. Mm. And yeah, that's what it is. I've even had, had the fact when you um, go, go, you have an interview. And then you never hear from them again. And then mm. they come back and say the excuse, their excuse was, is they're a bit worried that with your experience, as soon as something else comes along, you'll be off. Um, yeah. Yeah. So they took someone else instead. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So it's definitely age, ageism comes into a very lot. You know, I'm not really telling everybody what my age is, you know, because you know, I don't think 40 is about old. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Yeah, okay. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, sure. I've had interviews as well where I don't get any feedback whatsoever. Oh. And I, they're really annoying. <laughs> it's like when you're in oh. the process of um, being reviewed, then suddenly you get loads of engagement and then sometimes it's kind of that cold turkey um yeah. effect yeah. and then it kind of leaves you wondering was it me or what did I not perform right <laughs> it just gets you questioning sometimes doesn't it yes it does um I'll take it one step further than that especially when you you write your cv you've got the job spec there you yeah. know you've done everything and you actually tailor your cv perfectly yeah. to that job spec Mm -hmm. They turn around and say we found a better person, a better fit for that project. And you're thinking, no, you haven't. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've done exactly the same project for about three, four times. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and yeah. I put down everything in that job spec. Mm -hmm. And you say we found a better fit. And you think, no, you haven't. That's definite. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess that's probably... what you're saying. You never get, yeah, you don't get the feedback as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. Only that one we found something better for the role, a better fit. Yeah. I was going to also um, point to the fact that you said sometimes the fear is that maybe they think that you're too good at the role, that if you take it, you, then you're not going to be there for the long term. So obviously from a recruitment perspective, they don't want to have to keep recruiting for that role. So maybe they want yeah. someone who's who's not as experienced, so it will take longer for them to pick up the skill sets um, yep. to, exactly. to be able to be but onboarded. Also, on a similar note to that, you, I've also come across quite a lot that they put down all these things in their job spec and you think, well, I've done all that, you know, and then they take somebody else because, firstly, you're asking... Say, say, for instance, 450 a day. For a yeah. 
then they take somebody that's charging 300 for doing the same job. They're going to take the $300 uh, mm -hmm. one. But uh, I've come across where about six months later, yeah. they've had to get rid of that person yeah. and bring someone else in because they messed up so badly because they never had the experience and they had never had the, the sort of things that they, not necessarily the skills because the yeah skills, but the soft skills like how mm. to manage people how to bring in stakeholders how to engage with um people you know um especially your stakeholders because that's one of the biggest things um and another thing that a lot of projects tend to forget i've had it in a lot of projects where they've actually forgot to engage the business so they get a couple of years down the line and they're running out of money and and then all of a sudden the business finds out about it and they say well why isn't anyone engaged business i had that in australia once you know project oh. was about 10 times over its budget they went finally went to the business for some money and the business didn't even know about the program yeah so yeah but Could you expand more on like what type of what are the skills that are is required in order to be successful with, as a project manager? Um, I just brushed on then soft skills. Yeah. Uh, what, you know, more because anybody can read a book and learn the technical stuff, but it's an experience thing where you develop the soft skills, like how to bring in or engage with. Firstly, the people you're working with. So you need that to build teams, how to um, engage with stakeholders, product owners, um, basically every everybody that's involved with that project, and especially cross-functional teams. One minute, you're, you've got to put so many hats on. It's just a complete juggling um, experience. You know, you, you're talking to technical people, talking to business people, I haven't got a clue about the technical things. Yeah. So you've got to be able to get a, gra a grasp of all the technical issues. So although you don't have to know it inside out as a project manager, you've got to have an under a basic understanding of it. So when you're in a meeting, you don't have to keep um, saying, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? You know, because obviously people aren't, aren't going to like have that all the time. But you've also got to understand the business side of things, which... You know, so um, so you can engage with those various different types of people. When you've got issues come up, the the engineer will call you and tell you what the problem is and why you can't um, go any f further until this is done. Then you've got to phone up the business person. You've got to explain that to them. So you you've got to have a good understanding of the technical issues and the business side of things, especially when it comes to funding. You know, because you're trying to buy something. Mm. You've got to explain to a non-technical person why you have to put this price on it. And you have to sometimes the technical person wants the all singing and all dancing thing, which 50% of the stuff isn't needed. They just like it because they, they're techies and they like it. So you've got to explain to them the business side of things, why they can't have it, you know. Mm. Um, yeah. So that's a, a number of skills that aren't every day um put down. But it's one of the things that you, in fact, that's probably one of the biggest skills that you need is how to negotiate between different types of people, different teams. You also got to bring your vendors. So you got to be able to manage your vendors. Um, you got to be able to negotiate um, certain things for better pricing. Um, all that. Plus, you've got to explain to your um, initially for your vendor what what um, when you're searching. Uh, for a vendor, what you what the requirements are, so you've got to be able to talk to them what your requirements are, the initial stuff because you you do a lot of the work initially just yourself, and then bringing your technical teams and your business teams further down the line when you're setting up meetings with them to give the final points, and then you've got a set of requirements. You've got to have your functional, non-functional um, requirements, your business requirements, all that sort of stuff. So you've got to all list out all those as well. Um, when when all that, uh, all that gets signed off, you got to then make sure that all the requirements you've sold, uh, that the um, vendor is signing off on, that you actually get them. So you have got to make out some sort of matrix and tick off when they're when they're um, tested and 
everything. So yeah, it's a whole lot of stuff you need to, well, it's not just. Yeah. You have, oh, to, okay. know, you have to have a little bit of background knowledge, a little bit of um, the ability to be able to think outside the box as well and wear lots of hats. You know. I know you touched on earlier uh, regarding uh, drafting or racy. What approach do you find that works when you're managing like stakeholders and all the kind of different ones that you've mentioned? Oh, how you manage them? Yeah. Well, as I as I say, you you've usually got meetings. Yeah. You know, and a lot of the time they're, they're scheduled meetings. Um, with stakeholders you, you don't need all your stakeholders in every single meeting so you what you do is choose the meetings that you you only bring the essential people that are needed in that particular meeting you know yeah um there's no point bringing every single person to every meeting because one one of the things i put in my schedules as well is these meetings if they're if they're regular scheduled meetings um and obviously that costs a lot of money meetings. so i only have the the scheduled people that are required for a particular meeting. There's no no point bringing the um like um uh, like a the CEO in something that's only needed for like um that's a financial thing that the financial um the the financial director needs or something. So you you bring them in with a couple of other people who can explain why it is. Like you don't need every person in the same meetings. So, because uh, obviously, as I just touched on, it does cost money. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people aren't aware of these. So, one of the little tricks that I used to have when I was having a meeting, it's funny enough, I used to have the meeting over lunchtime. Okay? Oh. And the reason why I had it at lunchtime, I would put down and say, lunch is provided. And it's so amazing how many people turn up when you say it's lunch is provided, you know? But if you have it any other time of the day, they won't even turn up. You have to without even telling you. So you might you might have had ten people in the meeting, and five of them turn up, or even if one of them doesn't turn up, and the one that doesn't turn up is essential. They're all essential, but the one if you're waiting for decisions, if that person, then you just have to call it. Oh, there's no point carrying on. You know, so mm -hmm. I used to hold a lot of meetings at lunchtime and say lunch is provided, and they all come in and they all eat the lunch. We'll have a really good meeting, you know. I used to go down to local subways, um, and order, you know, the lunches. For, yeah. Like, uh, you know, it's quite cheap. I used to put on the budget as well. Yeah. You know, I used to, I used to, when I was working out budgets, I used to factor in all those things as mm. well. So, um, yeah. So that's one good way of managing them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as I say, the other way is you go up. Oh. We brushed on this before when I used to keep them informed of what's mm. going on with emails and in the door in the corridor um ad hoc meetings. Yeah. Um, also on the subject of ad hoc meetings, if there's something serious, you don't have to have a meeting, you'll quickly schedule a meeting and you know you, if you emphasize that how um urgent it is, then they'll always come along. Even if it's only I, I like to make meetings relatively short anyway, because in my experience what I found is that anything after the first half hour goes in there and out there straight away, especially if you're aiming the conversation at just one person and they're talking and no one else is talking. And then you go on to another person by them to oh yeah, what were we talking about? Yeah. So I like to make I I don't usually schedule meetings longer than an hour, you know, because it's just a waste of time. Mm -hmm. Um I try ad hoc meetings. I usually try to keep those to 15, 30 minutes, you know, because um, other people can put them in. They'll find a 15, 30 minute gap in their um, schedule where they can fit you in. Whereas if it goes any further, they'll say, no, 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 too busy, too busy. You know, because look, you, know, you always tend to forget that other people have got just as important roles. Mm. You know, they can't be there every five minutes. So you've got to, to work around other people's times as well yeah. yeah um for the younger viewers how can they go about 
developing some of the soft skills that you mentioned earlier? Um, it's generally with well, obviously the first thing comes with experience. You know, the other thing comes with um, just having an understanding of other people's roles. You know, and also in especially inside the business. And one of the things as a contractor, when you're permanent, it's probably a little bit different. Because when you're a contractor, you go into every time you go into a place is a different environment. Yeah. Um, same sort of you, you might say it's the same sort of company, but the environment's completely different. You, know, mm -hmm. so you, you have to be very, very adaptable. And that, that's why um in project work. Military people, funny enough, are very, very good at it because the in the forces you you are you learn how to be very adaptable. You know, one minute you're doing this, then the next minute you're doing something completely different, and you're meeting completely different people. You know, when when you go into a place, not everybody is tailored to work with you. You hope yes. you to tailor your skills to work with them. You know, because don't forget when you go into a place as a contractor. 50% of those people on the project are going to be permanent staff. And they've been in this yeah. company for maybe 10 years. You know? mm. So you can't go into a place and change everything overnight. Mm. You know, even though it's your job, you've got to come in and we want you to change the way they do their projects. Yes, but you can't go in there and do everything overnight. But that, that's them setting up a change management process, mm. um, which... The biggest issue I've had in this is when you were changing from the old public companies like yeah. um, BT, um, British Rail, I mean, Australia used to be Telstra or um, Aurora Energy, you know, and some of the workers there have been working for them for 40, 42, 45 years, you know, and they're not going to change their ways. You know, it's, it's amazing that some of these people, you had to come to you because you as their boss but you had to go to them and explain everything you were doing because they because all they did used to do is pick up the phone talk to all the other people and say oh, no, we've got this right in here now um he wants to change this make sure he doesn't change it <laughs> and so they, they'll put every blocker possible you know and funny thing is that actually does happen you know so you, you've you got to be very pragmatic. You've got to be able to get on with everybody, basically. And as I keep saying, you've got to have different hats for different people, you know. Um, you be very persuasive. Um, and, you know, you, you've got to, you've got to bear, always bear in mind that people don't change so easily. You know, even though it's a good idea, I say, well, we've been doing this for so many years now, it's always not been so good, but, you know, it, we're familiar with it. We don't have to change the things that we're doing. And that's mm -hmm. the thing you've got to um, stress a lot of time. Because really, every every project you do is different, and it's just for this company. However, every project is a change. So you've got to manage it very carefully, because especially once people, people are changing their ways of working, and the first thing people come up, come up and say is I'm gonna lose my job here, you know, then they mm. can get very stuck in, you know. So you've got to ensure them that they're not going to be changing their jobs. Their job will become more efficient, mm. you know, more slick, and you, you'll have more time to do other things that you have to do in your work as well. You know, when, when you can put that over to people, yeah, you generally um get them on side. Yeah. You know. And what about people that are in a completely different uh, sector or um, doing a different work altogether and want to branch into the project management domain? Do you have any advice to what kind of steps they can do, such as maybe courses that they can look at? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you can do a number of courses. You know, um, Prince Two um, mm. Foundation. You can, yeah. you can do that. It's a it's like a four day course. You know, um, and it's it's to 
start off with that's very good, you know, and it's a good build up into project management. Also, and then you can move on to um, the um, agile and you know, waterfall. And they're all offspring. A lot of them are all offsprings from agile. And you can go into that. Also, the Microsoft project as well. Learn, start learning that inside out and how mm. to schedule. You know, because that's a that is, I would say, that's the most important tool in a project manager's um, armory. You know, you can use that efficiently and getting everyone on board. And the other the other thing to also learn is how to work collaboratively, and don't do everything off your own back. You know. Like at the beginning of a project, for instance, I like to go in, get every person involved in that project and do it, you know, I'm still a bit old fashioned. I like to do a, a brown paper exercise where we sit in one room with the brown paper um, ball with loads of posts to say and work out what your work packages are, what your work breakdown structures are, uh, and then work down from there and then start to organize what has to be done before what. So every, every person involved yeah. Have, having a bit of an input i like to then put that schedule together get a budget from it okay? mm. and then once i've got final before i have a final document i then go I will, and ask everybody else another meeting or i'll send it around to everybody first you know so they can have a look through it and if they've got any changes um just jot them down and we'll put them in but we'll, we won't put them in until we have a meeting with everybody. So I've got everyone's um, changes that they'd like to see and why. So as well, everybody else that was in on that meeting can see the changes as well. So there'll be another scheduling meeting. You know, so this is what I'm saying. These are the these are the fundamentals of project management. You have to do the courses, Agile, Prince Two, yeah. um, yeah, they're, they're PMI, you know, so they're they're the they're the main ones you do scrum master and all that but as I say scrum master and agile is practically the same you know, just a little open can ban and all that it's all along the same um line, uh, different variations but uh, yeah they're the sort of things you've got to get into to get have you had any encounters of managing difficult stakeholders quote unquote and how have you managed it if you have well yeah, yeah. <laughs> Only get a difficult state. We're not allowed to call them difficult, though. <laughs> I, I probably be easier to say. Have you ever had an easy stakeholder? Yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, we passed on this quite a lot, you know. And although stakeholders are very difficult, mm. I like to get in place. As I talked about the racy matrix, mm. uh, I like to get in place uh, a formal communication channel. With the stakeholders, um, I like to inform them of any issues that are going to be coming up prior to meetings that we're going. I don't like to bring stakeholders on the spot because it, that's the worst thing you can do. Because if you bring yeah. someone on the spot, they'll put you on the spot sometime and they'll win. You know, so I like to keep them informed all the time, um, especially when it comes to budgets. You know, you've got to keep a very um, Tight rain over your budget. Um, a lot of big projects I've worked on, they've had their own accountants. Although you run the budgets, I've mm. worked very closely with the accountants, the project accountants, and how we've shuffled money around um, over things. And if a resource has been overstretched, how we've shuffled that resource to cut off some of their money to pass to another resource, you know, because all these things are signed off anyway. Um, so on, on the, the larger projects, it's easier to do where you can shuffle money around between OPEX and CAPEX and things like this. You know, yeah. just put it on. You can place certain things into OPEX and certain things into CAPEX and things, you know, so, so you just keep it on track. Other times you have to put in a change request for uh, more money. Um, what Obviously, in the change request that you put in, you've always got good reasons for the extra... Um, funding, um, yeah, that's what thing is. So you, you keep always keep your stakeholders on board over everything, you know. Um, sometimes too little information is, as it says, too little information. 
Um, just try to keep them, you don't have to give them too much information, but just keep them abreast of what's happening. You know, everything's yeah. run smooth this week, you know, or you, what I, what I like doing as well is sending them just a little snippet of the schedule and say, this is, this is how we are this week. Everything's been done on top, on track. In fact, some of those jobs were brought in a bit earlier, you know, so that gives us a bit more, um, leeway when things come out, passing the critical critical um, analysis, critical path analysis, pass them all that so they can see what's going on. You know? And then I like to do that. It's depending on how the meeting, like some of the projects are done they're, when they're high priority, high risk projects. Mm -hmm. um, you've got board meetings every, like every week, once a week. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so you spend your half your day, half your time through the week updating your reports. Say so, you know, I like getting them in there at least one day before meeting, so all the stakeholders can look at look ahead, especially what particularly um, interests them, you know. So, and that's one way of keeping them on board as well. And even the most difficult um, stakeholder, if you follow the processes, you keep them informed. There's nothing they can do, you know. So, even if they're still stubborn or still tricky, as long as you keep them overboard, what's happening? They, they usually come around to your way of thinking, you know, because there's nothing else they can do. You know? So, yeah. Or take yeah. them out and cut the pints. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Works. yeah. Can you describe a project that you've worked on um, that was successful and that you're particularly proud about? Yeah, I've just mentioned it actually. Yeah. Um, oh, I'll go back to another one as well. And that was working for Nortel Networks. And mm. we were doing a, oh, this is goes back to uh, 1999. You know? um, and it was a transformation project. It was an actual network build. The whole, it was a backbone, the whole of Germany. You know, it was the largest fiber optic um, network in the world at the time. And um, there was loads of um, colos, load of repeaters, base stations, everything that we're building. Um, we actually sold the client something that hadn't even been invented yet, but they bought it because um, it was under development. Um, so what happened, uh, well, go back to the history of it. First, there was a company called Lucent that, were, that was the that was doing the project. Star 21, they they were the client, and Lucent, they had a big fallout. You know, so Lucent sold the project to Nortel. The Nortel ended up taking over the project and it became very, very political. You know, uh, that when I joined it, I was actually said, well, Nortel work on this side of Frankfurt and Star 21, they live and work over the other side of Frankfurt. We don't cross paths because we, ne we never get on. It's bit silly. You know, so the people I was um, communicating with, two people from um, Star 21, well, they came from Southampton and we had something pretty quick on in common. You know, we had we had a meeting once a week. Just that we used to go through the plans, the schedules, what's coming up, what's what's not going too well, all this stuff. So what I used to do, instead of going to their their building or then coming over to our building, I used to meet in the middle at a Chinese takeaway, um, a Chinese restaurant. We used to have lunch and the meeting at the same time. We used to go on all afternoon. And then we used to go from the there to the airport together, you sit on the plane, still carrying on with the meeting. Absolutely worked brilliant. Then on the Monday, we'd all come into work as happy as Larry, you know, and then then the agro would start again, and then the work would start, and we'd just make sure we got it. And the project was actually about six months behind schedule when uh, we took over it. Um, what made it so good and for me personally rewarding was that. I completed the project one day behind the original schedule. You know, so it was one day overdue. 
but that was only because um, Star 21 cancelled the handover meeting till the next day just to make sure that they, they couldn't say we delivered it on time. <laughs> so, yeah, but we got the whole project done, you know, completely done. That was a load, a load of times on that. I was working 24 hours a day, especially on the schedule. We had, we had a scheduler there and we used to do a prime of era um, because there was about something in the region, about 50, 60,000 activities going on at the same time. So the Microsoft project couldn't handle it. SureTrack couldn't handle it. So it's changed to prime of era. Um, and there was, there was a lot of times that we were working 24 hours solid, most um, getting it all working and functional, all proper. But we actually managed to do it. And, you know, we were so, so proud of ourselves. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. That was good. Sounds... It was stressy, but good. Yeah. So the final question is that with what you know now, what three key um, lessons learned um, would you say that you can share? Um, yeah, probably one, one of them would be um, to focus more on difficult because I'm I'm a general project manager who goes across you know, I've done PMOs, I've done yeah. program management, I've done project management, and all those in IT and in telecoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if anything, I'd probably say I'd probably be more focused on one particular thing like maybe PMO management or just pure and pure technical project manager or yeah. you know something may maybe you know mm -hmm. although that's not my what i would like i would like yeah. to keep exactly the same way because i've got yeah. more um options yeah. in areas that i really do like you know um i'd say uh, the other the only other thing i'd probably say that I'd, i would change is by not getting older you know mm -hmm. have all the experience but stay young <laughs> that, would <be laughs> that would be nice way. yeah um yeah I'll, I'll probably get more qualified on um methodologies you mm. know because as i say i i find methodologies a good guide yeah but i don't stay rigid to that methodology <laughs> There's things you have to be able to change and think outside the box. Yeah. But one of the things I'd probably change in my life is probably keep my uh, methodology skills updated, mm. which I must admit I haven't done because I've got, I just never had the time. Yeah. You know, they're quite expensive. What mm. they are now, you, and now you have to change them every couple of, you've got to re upgrade every couple of years anyway. You yeah. Know, and they are quite expensive. Know, for like a three or four day course, you know. Um, yeah, so that probably one is probably get um, more qualified in um, met project method methodologies. I probably um, yeah. I I used to also do pro um, project programming. Oh, not project mm. program. Sorry, software programming. Okay. And I probably. Um, over over the years, I've completely lost that. Although I've just got up there the basics knowledge of it, you know, mm -hmm. I probably would have liked to keep a little bit more up to date on programming. Mm -hmm. You know, not do it as a profession, mm -hmm. but there's always something you can fall back on. Not when you're talking to developers. Yeah, you know, although you've got an understanding of it, you can't turn around and look at it and just say, "Oh, maybe that try this." You know, mm -hmm. you know, I, I could still probably do it, but it probably wouldn't be worthwhile, you know, because of lots of different um, programming languages nowadays. Yeah, so, but that would be another thing I'd change. So that's programming methodologies and more probably more focused yeah. on a particular role. So like 
PMO, for instance, become an expert in PMO or become an expert and program manager. You know, although I've done it, done all these, you know, I've made me more focused. You know, the other one I'll, I'll probably do is um, learn a bit more about uh, data migration. No, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Paul, for your time. That's been really um educative and eye-opening. Um, I'm sure that those that listen in and watch are going to get uh, various different pointers that they can also use to aid their journey as well. So yeah, that's really great. Thank you. That's okay. Nice talking to you. <laughs> Thank you.